So that's pretty normal, right? People can't make it back to their seats after greeting time. We're back in the flow already. All right, well, we are wrapping up our series on how to squander your potential. And we are going to look at one of the oddest stories in Scripture this morning. Um, we've been tracking with King Saul in 1 Samuel. Um, Saul is kind of our anti-lesson. Of, he's, he's really good at squandering his God-given potential, so he's really easy to pick on. And, and much of his squandering actually takes place because he just has a lack of consistency. He just can't stay committed one way or the other. And, and we see him in story after story. He would make a good decision, and then he'd turn around and make a bad decision. That's just kind of the way he, he rolled. He couldn't make two good decisions in a row, it seemed like. Um, So if you turn with me to 1 Samuel 28 this morning, 1 Samuel 28, that's where we're going to hang out this morning. And if you've never read this story, uh, I'm pretty sure you're going to think that this is a story that only Hollywood could come up with, but it's actually in the Bible. It's there. We're going to read it together. So beginning with verse 3 of 1 Samuel 28, it says, Now Samuel was dead, and if you remember, Samuel was the prophet while... Saul was king, right? And all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Uh, the, the prophet Samuel, he passed away, but as we learned last week, um, he really hadn't been around King Saul for the last 10 chapters. So it's not really a, a huge part of Saul's life at this point, which also meant that God wasn't an active part of Saul's life these last 10 chapters either. In fact, The situation is worse now than when we left it in the last story because there's a story we skipped in there in 1 Samuel 22 where where King Saul actually tries to kill off all the priests. Um, That's what he was after. The priests were trying to help out David, so um, King Saul decides to just whack him off, right? Um, I'm sure that didn't help Saul's cotton cause with God, wouldn't you think? Um, Just thinking through that. But then in the very next sentence, in 1 Samuel 28, back into that chapter, it tells us of a good decision that Saul makes. That kind of seems to be his pattern. He makes good decisions and bad decisions. The second part of verse 3, it says, Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. The mediums and spiritists. Now, mediums and spiritists were, were those individuals who claimed to have the ability to contact the dead. We probably still have a few of those people around, right? They either serve as an intermediary where the dead actually talk through that person or, or they actually rouse the dead to speak for themselves. Kind of a scary idea. Um, but it's an interesting detail in the story, right? And these were kind of necromancers. They were spiritual charmers, right? Seems to be straight out of the Lord of the Rings movies. For those who are fans of the Lord of the Rings movies, you know, that's, that's what... We see that happening, and, and, and the people of God, not surprisingly, were forbidden to, to use these mediums, these spiritists. Back in Leviticus 20, God says, I will set my face against anyone who turns to mediums and spiritists to prostitute themselves by following them, and I will cut them off from their people. So roughly translated, don't do it. <laughs> You're not allowed to do it. You will be sorry if you decide to hang out with mediums and And spiritists, it's a form of idolatry, um, looking to someone else or even something else to find direction direction in our lives other than God, right? In fact, Isaiah mentions in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19, when someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God instead? I mean, isn't that a good idea? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? And that's a great question, isn't it? Why would you do that? So King Saul, he'd kicked out all these mediums and spiritists from their land. And, you know, that's a great job, Saul. Nice, nice job. Um, but can you make two good decisions in a row? That's still up yet to be seen. Back to 1 Samuel 28, verse 4. It says, The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shunem, while Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. So here we go again. In all of our stories in 1 Samuel, there seemed to be some type of battle. And it's never usually the Israelites attacking, but they're defending themselves from another 
another nation, another um, people group. When Saul saw that the Philistine ar- saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. So we actually see Saul in this verse starting to do the right thing, right? He was wanting to talk to God when he needed some help. And that's a really good step for Saul. He doesn't usually do that. And, and he was hoping, really, from an immediate answer from God. And how many of you, when you pray to God looking for direction, you'd like to get an immediate answer? And I can actually see hands this morning, so that's just awesome, right? Um, we like immediate answers. So he was looking for an immediate answer from a dream or maybe just a direct revelation from God or at least from a Urim or even from a prophet, which I'm pretty pretty sure that no prophet would approach Saul at this point because the lead prophet, Samuel, wanted nothing to do with him. So why would they want anything to do with him, right? And what's this Urim thing that's mentioned here? Anyone know what a Urim is? Well, Urim was the device that was actually given to to Aaron back in Exodus 28 when he was being um, named the priest. Um, It's to help the Israelites make decisions. That's what it was about. And and that Urim had been passed down through the generations to all the different priests in the line of Aaron, um, which were the priests in Israel. And we already kind of covered that, you know, that Saul wanted to kill all the priests, so they're probably not going to give him any help, right? It's just not going to happen. So here Saul is. He's needing some direction, and he's running out of options. And he's never been good at waiting on the Lord to answer, right? We've looked at that in other stories. So instead of maybe looking over his life and at least seeing what God may be seeing in his life and why he's not answering him, um, what does he do? (laughs) You betcha. King Saul takes a bad situation and he makes it way, way, way worse, right? He really is the poster child of squandering um, your God-given potential. He's just so good at it, isn't he? Have you ever been in a difficult situation and you just wanted to get out of it? No matter what it cost you, you were just going to get out of it. You didn't care what you had to do to get out of it. You're going to quit no matter the cost, (laughs) And this COVID situation really has been that for some of us, right? We're so tired of this. I just want to get everything back to normal. Normal, right? Even though normal is not possible. And we're willing to really do anything. Ignore all good sense and make it happen. And this is where Saul is, right? Listen to what King Saul does. Verse 7. Saul then said to his attendants, Find me a woman who is a medium, so I may go and inquire of her. There's one in Endor, they said. So a great idea, Saul, right? You guys with him on this? Not a great idea? I'm sure this medium would be smarter than God, or maybe the dead person that she calls up, smarter than God, right? And because Saul had kicked out the mediums, the spiritists, out of the land, we actually know that he knows better, right? Right? So we can't even use that excuse. But, but we're really not talking about logic in this conversation, right? He's terrified. He's desperate. He felt like he had nowhere else to turn. No one else is going to talk to me, so maybe I'll find someone who's already dead to talk to me, right? I mean, it's just the oddest story. And those of you who are Lord of the Rings fans, you, you will know this mention of Endor, Indoor is in the Lord of the Rings. But, but that's not what's talking, what it's talking about here. Um, Indoor is also a town located just a couple miles northwest of where the Philistine camp was, which means that King Saul couldn't get there very easily. There was going to be guards out, and he was going to have to sneak by. So verse 8, so Saul disguised himself, putting on out other clothes. And at night he and two men went to the woman, And he says to her, consult a spirit for me and bring up for me the one that I name. But the woman said to him, surely you know what Saul has done. He's cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring bring about my death? And she doesn't know that it's Saul that she's talking to, right? 
Why are you setting me up? Why are you going to get me in trouble? Verse 10, Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Now, isn't that the weirdest oath for Saul at this moment in time? He's swearing on the Lord? Um, as surely as the Lord lives. I'll tell you what, Saul, if the Lord does live, you're in deep trouble, right? You won't be in a position to make any promises to any medium if the Lord is alive, right? And you're going to be in way bigger trouble than, than any army could bring on you, any human army, right? Verse 11, then, when, then the woman asked, Whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel. Samuel. Great choice, Saul. I mean, think about this. Saul, Samuel, he wouldn't even talk to him for the last who knows how many years. And you're going to call up Samuel, who's ticked off at you, didn't want to talk to you? Have you fully lost it, Saul? Why are you calling up Samuel? But as crazy as this story sounds, it gets crazier because Samuel actually shows up. Verse 12, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and she said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You're, you are Saul. Somehow she knew that it was Saul, right? As soon as she sees Samuel, she knows it's Saul. Verse 13, the king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? Don't be afraid. That is what King Saul is feeling. I mean, that's why they're in this situation, right? Because he's terrified. The woman said to her, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. Well, what does he look like? Well, he looks like an old man wearing a robe. He's coming up. Then Saul knew that it was Samuel. <laughs> and he bowed down and he prostrated himself with his face to the ground. And then Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul says, well, I'm in great distress. The Philistines are fighting against me and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Now this was the arrangement back in the, the good old days, back when he first became king, right? Saul, God had set up Samuel over Saul to, to instruct him of what God wanted him to do. And, and that was all good. But back then, Saul wouldn't listen. He didn't want God telling him what to do. He didn't want Samuel telling him what to do. He wanted to be in charge. He wanted to put his faith in himself, not in God, right? And this is why Saul was an expert at squandering his God-given potential, right? He really couldn't commit to doing anything, <laughs> wrong or right. He just couldn't stick with it. So on to verse 16. Verse 16 says, Samuel said to Saul, Why do you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and, and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Malachites, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me, which means they'll be dead, right? The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. And immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what King Saul was trying to get out of this conversation, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't this, right? Uh, now, there are times when I'm, you know, having a conversation or if I'm in a Bible study and you run across stories um, and, you know, someone in the conversation might look at a story like this and say, you know, God is, he's such an angry God. Why is he so angry? Why is he so full of wrath? And, you know, when people bring up those, bring up things like that, I, I, I look at them and I usually say in my brain, I don't always say it out loud because, you know, but ask, what story did you just read? Do you think God wanted Saul to fail? I mean, think about it. You remember the beginning of the story. God had set Saul up for success. He wanted them to succeed. 
Saul wasn't just left up to his own devices when he became king. He, he wasn't just making things up. God gave Saul an advisor in Samuel, right? God gave, he, he even provided his own spirit to empower Saul when he was willing to do what God asked him to do, right? God gave him plenty of help to live into his potential. He did. Yet Saul continued to treat God as a business partner. Not having a personal relationship, just a business partner there to be taken advantage. Not a very good business partner, by the way, at all. The only time Saul referred to God was when he was in deep trouble, right? And, and he only followed God's instructions when they made sense to him, which is usually when they made sense politically or uh, militarily, made sense to him, made him look good. Um, and time after time, God gave Saul grace, offered him so much patience over and over and over again in the story. Yet at every turn, Saul, he just seemed to turn away from God over and over and over again. He just couldn't stay committed to God's ways. And so in my thinking, God is saying, Saul, if you want a godless life, if you don't want me to part, be part of your life, um, I'll give it to you. If you don't want me around, okay. <laughs> I want to help. But you don't want to do it my way. And really, if you look at this story and you consider that wrath, you consider him an angry God because he's given in to Saul, I mean... Is it on God when we reject Him? Really? Honestly. And honestly, if you look at the shocked response of the medium, I mean, she screamed at the top of her lungs when she saw Samuel. Isn't that kind of odd for someone who's always doing this? Could this be the first person she's ever called from the dead? Maybe all the rest of it was a hoax. Maybe it wasn't the skill of the medium at all. Maybe it was God doing this unique act giving Saul one more chance to get a warning. <laughs> Come on, Saul. Respond here. Another sign of God's grace in Saul's life. Whatever the details of this odd encounter was, Samuel's words, they did come to pass, right? If you continue reading the story, Saul does die at the hands of the Philistines by the next day. He didn't seem to take advantage of that one last warning. And, and we're not really all surprised by that because he was really good at squandering the God-given potential in his life. Um, so the question comes back to us. What about you? Where do you go when God seems silent? I mean, this really can be a common struggle, struggle among believers, right? Trying to hear from God. Where is he? And Saul had an opportunity to choose his response. He could, have, he could have checked his heart for sin, right? He could have found what he was doing against the Lord and repented and decided to trust in the Lord instead, right? I mean, he could have even stayed patient and waited on the Lord, waited to hear from the Lord. But instead, he, he took the matter in his own hands and he did his own thing, which was his pattern. Is that our pattern? It's hardest to trust God when he seems silent, right? But perhaps that's actually a moment for us um, to grow in our faith. To think through, where, where am I in this relationship with the Lord? To not jump to conclusions, but to actually pay attention even more. Where is God working? What is he doing? What's he trying to say? And when it feels like God is absent, we really are tempted to believe that he really is. And at this point in Saul's life, he's, he has so many unrepentant sins just kind of building up in there that he's just susceptible to believe just about anything, I think. That God actually was absent, or at least that he wasn't strong enough to help him in this situation. Author John Bloom, who wrote an article, When God Seems Silent, he, he says in his article this, I think this is helpful. Atheists will tell us that the reason God seems silent is because he's absent. 
No one's home at the address. Duh. In the silent suffering seasons, we can be tempted to believe it. Until we step back and we take a look and we see that existence itself is not silent. It screams God. I mean, think of Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So if we just take a moment, take a step back, and look around, look at nature itself, and you will see that God's at work. He does amazing things in our lives. He's not absent. And then John Bloom continues, believing atheism is like Moderns believing in a flat earth. From where I stand, it doesn't look like God is there. Right. And if you only trust in your perceptions, the world looks flat. The only reason you know the world is round is because of authoritative scientific revelation and many corroborating testimonies. (laughs) And in the same way, we can know that God is here. I mean, look around, pay attention. See how he's working in different people's lives. See how he's working in nature. There really is a unique danger that some people face when they enter into a season of God's silence. And it's one that really could be applied to to Saul's life. As we've been mentioning before, he, he was relying on someone else's faith, right? He constantly was saying, well, let's go worship your God. He never said, my God. He was always relying on someone else's relationship with God instead of cultivating his own relationship with God. And during this COVID situation, many of us have had large amounts of time alone, right? We've had some isolation times. And, and Saul was in the same boat, right? Near the end of his life, he's, all of his advisors are gone. The prophets, the priests, Samuel, Jonathan, his son, David, was a, a big help to him at different times in his life, right? Bringing him peace. And because of this isolation, he had to rely on his own relationship with the Lord. He had to rely on not everyone else's opinion about what this means, but me and God. And because of this isolation, I think um, he had to realize... <laughs> that his relationship with God was severely lacking. Didn't know how to talk to God. Didn't know how to hear from God. And maybe some of you have experienced the same thing as we've gone through this time of isolation. Those people in our lives that are spiritual advisors to us, they haven't been in reach. We couldn't just go out for a coffee. What, 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 is taught, what has been um, your experience with all of this isolation? and your relationship with the Lord. So, what do we do about this? Well, as things slowly return to normal, you actually have an opportunity to ignore (laughs) that anything ever happened. I mean, if you had a struggle in your relationship with the Lord um, during the isolation time, now that we're returning back to normal, I mean... Yeah, you discovered a hole in your spiritual lives that that you couldn't quite fill. You needed to work on your relationship with the Lord a little bit more. But now you're returning to normal and and you can start relying on those other people again, right? And Saul certainly did a lot of ignoring in his own life about spiritual things, right? But you can also take this opportunity seeing that there was something in your life that was lacking, something spiritual. Um... And instead, to to not choose to just go back to normal. Instead, choose to change your routines. To learn and grow in your personal walk with the Lord. I mean, could it be that the things that you learned during this isolation time period may actually become a huge blessing in your life because you develop your own relationship with the Lord? Could that be possible? You know, Scripture tells us that about tough times and what they produce in the life of a believer. In the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the church in Rome, Paul says, 
and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance then produces character, and then character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. <laughs> so back to the beginning of this. What, what, is, what does perseverance mean? Well, it means that we don't quit, right? We keep going, even in those hard times. That's perseverance. Good things can come out of difficult situations if we will choose to stay on task. To persevere, because that leads to character, right? And then character leads to hope. It all goes together. As we stay on task, as we stay focused on the Lord, we can grow in Him. James says something similar in James chapter 1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. There it is again. We don't quit. We stay strong even in those difficult times. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So we can actually take advantage of difficult times. We can learn to lean on the Lord in a deeper way because of those difficult times. We can learn to persevere and grow in character. And not that these difficult times will magically become good because they don't right but we can use them to learn things about ourselves learn things about our spiritual lives and discover the gaps in our faith these sour moments can bring us closer to the lord these sour moments can help us mature as his people now you probably heard the saying when life gives you lemons you make lemonade right well, what does that mean? What's that quaint phrase mean? Well, you're going to have those sour moments in life. It's going to happen, right? So, why don't you just make the most of them? Isn't that what that means? Make some lemonade. I mean, have you ever had a cold glass of lemonade on a really hot day? Not like today, but like a couple days back. <laughs> Tastes pretty good, right? Now, if you think about this expression, it really kind of leads to this kind of optimistic determination um, during a difficult time. Just have a good attitude and life will be better. Um, you just have to change your thinking and try harder and, and, and good things will happen. But I just want to point out that there is one flaw in this thought process and this idea when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. You know what it is? When you make Lemonade. I mean, have you ever taken just the lemons and added water to make lemonade? Pretty sour, right? So you're still having a sour drink if all you're taking is lemons and adding water. You've got to add another ingredient, ingredient, right? What do you got to add? Sugar. Sugar. Good old sugar, right? So a good attitude, let's just take these lemons and, and, and take them into our own hands and make something good happen, right? Well, that approach, as good as it sounds, it doesn't actually result in a refreshing drink, right? I mean, just ask Saul. He did that over and over again. He was taking those lemons, adding water, and voila, he's still sour, right? What is required is the third ingredient in our lives. You know who the sugar is in our life? God. We need His influence in our life. In fact, we still are flying the red colors of Pentecost. We need the Holy Spirit working in our lives, right? God's the one who brings goodness. God's the one who brings maturity and, and ultimately the, the sugar that we can add to our lemonade from the lemons of life and, and even maybe enjoy it. A difficult, sour moment. Could that be possible? Forgetting the sugar, though, that can be devastating, right? You don't just add water to lemons and expect to get anything but the sour thing that you're enjoying to begin with, <laughs> or not enjoying. So again, how about you? Are you willing to not just rush back into the normal, to not forget the lessons that you learned when you were isolated and all by yourself? 
What did you learn about your relationship with the Lord? Who are you depending on? Maybe for some of you, actually, the, the importance of relationships with other believers, with other human beings, maybe is something that you learned. I mean, we, we are designed to have those deep relationships with other human beings, right? Just watch the news, what this isolation has done to people. Just look at your friends, probably. <laughs> Why are they so grumpy? Well, we're not designed to do this, right? Not designed to be by ourselves. That's a God thing. And that's why we have small groups in our churches. We need each other. It's not good enough to just wave at each other across the sanctuary, right? We want to get back to being together. But maybe what you learned is that your faith was a little lacking. And, and you didn't have quite enough sugar to make this sour moment uh, palatable even refreshing. I mean, have you found that you need to work on cultivating a deeper walk with the Lord? Think about that. Did this relationship with did your relationship with the Lord get better or worse as you went through this difficult isolation period? I mean, would you be willing to be honest with God about this? And even go about making some time for him. Changing up your routine so you make sure you spend time with Him. Spending time in prayer, spending time in Scripture reading, even spending time with other believers, right? We need God in our life. We need Him. And you know, if, if, you're, if you need some processing to get through this, if you need some advice, you're not really alone in this, right? I know you know people who have God working in their lives, <laughs> And they would be a great resource to you. Reach out to them. I mean, we're, you're not alone in this. We're all in the same boat. We're all trying to grow in the Lord, right? This is just too important to just ignore and return to normal. Let's work on this. What is God reminding you about, pushing you on? And, and as we're thinking through this, you'll notice this summer a growing presence within our campus here, of lemon-related things. Okay? You're going to see lemons show up here and there, and we're going to be talking more about this lemonade process. So hopefully, as you see a lemon, as we begin reinforcing this idea, that when you see the lemon, you'll remember the most important ingredient, God. Add sugar to my life. I see a lemon, add sugar to my life, Right? So as we wrap up this series, would you just spend a moment and talk to the Lord with me? Lord, we've been talking all about not wanting to squander our God-given potential. And all of us have potential in us that you have put on us. You have plans for us. You have abilities and skill sets and, and relationships that you have given to each and every one of us. And we don't want to squander those things. We want to stay committed to your ways rather than taking matters into our own hands and leaving you behind. We, we want your help in our lives. Would you help us to find ways to remember the lessons that we've learned about ourselves in difficult times? Maybe even the gaps in our faith, Lord. Would you help us to remember that we need to be relying on on you personally. We need that personal relationship with you. We need to invest in you, our relationship with you. Lord, would you help us to build into our lives routines that help us grow in our relationship with you? But also put into our routine our, our relationships with other people too. We need them too as we've learned through this time. Help us to remember the sugar that is needed in our lives. You are what is most needed in our lives in order to provide rest for our souls. You are what we need. We need your help. And we trust in you, Lord. We trust in you as our rock, as our Savior, as our hope, as our Lord, 
We will give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand this morning as we close the service? just want to re- read a couple verses from Matthew 11 for our benediction passage. Um, verse 28 says, Come to me, Jesus speaking, Come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Are you weary and burdened? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Anyone here need to find rest for your soul? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. People of God, our hope is in the Lord. Amen. This week, would you choose to go with Him? <laughs> choose to spend time with Him. Choose to, to make new routines in your life, to make sure you're growing in that relationship. Would you choose to trust in Him? Find rest for your souls. You are sent.